Okay, so here's where we were last time. Uh, so we were talking about um, algebra of vectors. We define vectors. Make sure to remember there's a difference between vectors and points. Right? Points are locations. They just sit there. Vectors are directions and magnitudes. They represent things like displacements and forces and velocities. They don't have a location. You can't point to there it is. There's uh, a displacement. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't, ha it doesn't work like that. Um, okay, so uh, that said, we just tried to come up with an algebra of vectors, and one of the operations we wrote down was, uh, you know, what does it mean to multiply a vector times a scalar? And we came up with this formula, motivated largely by this picture here, um, where if you have a vector, and if, uh, you know, what should it mean to multiply that vector by a scalar? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty plausible. Think of that vector as uh, as a displacement. C times that displacement means it's going that same direction, just C times as much. Okay, what we did not talk about is what if C is negative, right? Um, what does it mean to go negative two times a given displacement? Well, this picture, which motivates this formula, Right, sort of. If we want to keep this formula, then well, when C is negative, if this has got a you know a, a negative sign on it, well, then I guess we had to just sort of have to put a negative sign on those constants as well. The formula dictates what it sort of has to be, which would give rise to this picture here if C is negative, right? And um, and I just want to point out, well, that's uh, this is a good thing, right? This is actually kind of plausible if uh, if you want to do. Uh, a negative constant times a given vector. The negative, how would you interpret the negative? Be pretty plausible to interpret the negative of saying go the opposite direction. So, it, so this uh, formula that was motivated from the point of view of positive constants actually is pretty nicely compatible with negative constants. So I think that's a nice observation. Um, uh, next thing I want to point out, and this is an exercise that I want you all to do uh, on your own, but with this formula for matrix scalar multiplication in mind, um, prove that formula. Uh, this says that if you look at the magnitude of a scalar times a vector, that that is, I'm going to loosely say the scalar times the magnitude of the vector, but notice it's not exactly what this formula says. This says the absolute value of that scalar times the magnitude of the original vector. And I want y'all to go through and identify for yourselves where is it that the absolute value comes up. Uh, this, um, this absolute value. Why is there an absolute value there? Now, I'll give you uh, the point. Right? Um, to just see so nobody gets stuck on this. Um, there is a common misconception about algebra. A lot of students, and look, this is just the way schools work. Um, you know, when you're in middle school and learning about square roots for the first time, uh, well, you, you're young. You're, what, uh, 12, 13, something like that, and just subtlety is not a, doesn't fit into most curricula at that age, right? And so a lot of people get mis- uh, mis the miscommunication that square roots just undo squares. A lot of students mistakenly believe that the square root of c squared is c. And I would just like to point out that is not always true. This is not. Um, this symbol here means uh, the positive uh, square root. That's what that symbol means. Okay. If you want to, for whatever reason, such as in the quadratic equation, if you want to refer to two different numbers, those being both of the square roots of a given uh, real, real positive real number, then you have to say plus minus. You got to put that plus minus in there. That square root symbol there does not imply the plus minus. That means the positive one. Right? Okay, so with this in mind, let's revisit this little bit of uh, algebra here, square root of c squared. What is the positive square root of c squared? Well, here's the thing. I know c is one of the square roots, but if c is negative, then c is not the positive square root. c is the negative square root. And so what would the positive square root be in that case? Well, it would be the absolute value of c.
Okay, so this is the the algebraic point. Uh, you're going to find that as you explore this, um, as you start, you know, sort of computing both sides of this equation here, you know, crank it out in terms of coordinates. By the way, you can just do this in, in three dimensions, just in R3. Don't worry about doing it in R8. Um, as you start working out both sides in terms of coordinates, you're going to find yourself taking a square root of a square. And it's important to realize that that means an absolute value. Is everybody good on the on the uh, on the, the review of the the algebra? Just out of academic curiosity, how many people before this little discussion were solid, comfortably cool with this fact before just now? Okay, good. Well, I'm glad we talked about it then. Um, so this again, it's a very common problem um, and uh, something that you know. Now that we're taking a robust math class, it's something. This kind of thing is the sort of thing that we have to be really worried about. <laughs> Another, uh, but this is a tangential, another common misconception about algebra is in how to deal with inequalities. It, so this is very, very quickly, I don't want to get too far off of, uh, you know, where we're going. Um, but uh, a lot of people think that uh, you can take, in the same way that you can take an equation, and you can, as long as you do anything to both sides, then it's still an equation, it's still true, right? Let's multiply both sides by minus one. I'm going to say uh, times negative one, and I'm going to put a question mark here to indicate that you know I'm asking: Is this valid? Can I multiply both sides by negative one to thus result in negative a less than negative b? I mean, this is kind of what this. I mean, you know, we've grown up since middle school or so thinking: Look, if you have an algebra, you do the same thing to both sides of the equation, and it just works. Right? Well, this is not true. In fact, it's pretty easy to persuade yourself that this is not true. One is less than two, but negative one is not less than negative two. Right? So, okay, so the algebra of inequalities is another thing that in a lot of middle schools and high schools, that this kind of gets swept under the rug. Um, and so now it's not something to be aware of at this point. It's something to be really careful about. Okay. And by the way, if you want to, if you want to, have a discussion about you know what are the rules for inequalities and how can you decide what you're allowed to do and what you're when are, when are you going to step on a landmine like that and when is it totally cool okay office hours would be a great time to talk about that so feel free to feel free to come and discuss y'all got my email by the way about uh okay so office hours start today class goes today 10 to 12 by the way we are going to take a break in the middle <laughs> y'all need to a break for your ears. I need a break for my mouth. Um, and uh, there's a little coffee machine right out there. Some of y'all I know have already seen it. Um, and so we'll take a 10 minute break, something like that, uh, and then uh, and then pick back up. Okay. All right. And then office hours one to two. Okay. All righty. Uh, let's see here. Um, here's some properties, uh, algebraic properties of uh, the uh, the algebraic operations that we've just defined. Now, again, this is. Uh, I roll time. Well, of course, of course these are true. My gosh, haven't I known this equation here for like 10 years? Right? Did y'all have to learn? I, I, they made me when I was in elementary school. I remember distinctly in fifth grade, I had to learn that an equation that looked a lot like this was called the commutative property of addition. Y'all remember that? I remember thinking, my God, what a big word. For such a small point, right? <laughs> okay. Very importantly, that's not the same equation. This is a big deal. This operation right here, that thing is not the operation called addition that you learned about in the fifth grade or I guess the third grade, whenever you start adding, I forget. Um, that is a brand new operation that we just defined yesterday. Addition of vectors is just not the same as addition of scalars. Yeah, right. This is, I mean, keep in mind we made a choice. We pulled a rabbit out of a hat yesterday. We made it up. It was a a, a uh, construction out of nothing. So just because you use a familiar-looking symbol 
to represent your new operation, that does not magically confer nice algebraic properties on that new operation that you just defined, right? So, okay, so I just wanted to point out that these, uh, these, you know, again, familiar looking properties of, uh, you know, all, let's say algebraic properties are not, uh, I roll perfectly obvious. Our old friends from middle school, right? These are all brand new properties. And you gotta be a little worried about whether these are actually true. And good news, they are, right? But nevertheless, Something that has to be thought about. Um, I would like to encourage you all to try to prove at least, uh, let's say, two of these on your own. I'm not going to make an assignment or anything. But, for example, this, we have a definition of what it means to add two vectors V and W. And you can write directly down in coordinates what it means to add V plus W. You can then, likewise, write down exactly what it means in coordinates to add W plus B. And then just check and confirm that, yeah, you get the same thing. So that's all you got to do. It's no big deal. It's just got to get done. Okay, so um, try that. Do that for a couple of these. In all, in all five of these cases, it's just a matter of writing it down in coordinates. If you're comfortable with the two of them, then it's fine. You're, I'm sure you're good with the rest. Okay. Um, all right, a uh, new idea. We're going to talk about a special kind of vector called a unit vector. A, a vector is a unit vector if it has magnitude equal to 1. Uh, it turns out there's some nice things that you can do if a vector is a unit vector. So that's why it has a, a name. Uh, a couple of uh, easy examples of unit vectors. Those are easily seen to be unit vectors. By the way, these are special unit vectors. As a pair, uh, these are referred to as the standard basis vectors in R2. Um, I mean, no surprise, right? I mean, these are the two vectors that that point, you know, along the x-axis, along the y-axis, you know, length one. Um, <coughs> so, um, anyway, this terminology, standard basis vectors, uh, uh, when we get into Math 216, well, if y'all take Math 216 or Math 218 or Math 221, then someday we'll talk about where that terminology comes from. But yeah, here in Math 212, it's just lingo. So standard basis vectors. Okay. Um, analogously in R3, these are called the standard basis vectors in R3. Uh, you, easy to notice the pattern. These point along the X, Y, and Z axes in the positive directions, magnitude 1. Okay. All right, um, here's a common scenario. Common scenario is that you have some vector given that's not a unit vector, and you wanna find the unique unit vector pointing in the same direction of the given non-zero, non-unit vector. How would you find the unit vector that's pointing in the same direction of a non-unit vector? And so the idea is, well, there's your non-unit vector. Uh, you want to find the unit vector pointing in that same direction. Um, notice that these are multiples of each other. And this is what scalar multiplication looks like, right? And the clever move is to realize that this does it. Just take that non-unit vector Divide it by its own magnitude, and the result will have magnitude equal to 1, as uh, demonstrated by this little calculation here. So it's a really nice trick. Uh, so two things. First of all, make sure that you memorize this formula. It's a, it, this comes up all the time. It's uh, ultra um, common and very convenient and easy to memorize. Okay. So make sure to know that formula. Um, also, I want to encourage you all to read through this little algebraic argument. It's no big deal. Right? But think about one step at a time, what is it that makes each step work uh, to get this conclusion? And notice our conclusion, exactly as required, is that this vector u has magnitude equal to 1 and therefore is a unit vector. Okay. All right. Okay.
Um, a bunch of exercises. I emailed y'all last time. Uh, uh, I emailed y'all yesterday afternoon uh, with the uh, the list of exercises. Uh, I pared it down just a little bit. Um, these exercises are relatively no big deal, and we only had one section to cover, so I didn't feel the need to pare it back down uh, very much. Uh, but we all are now good to to do all all these exercises. Okay. Um, so, what does it mean to multiply two vectors? Going on to the next section now. Uh, l- reminder, what have we done so far? We've talked about what it means to add two vectors. We've talked about what it means to subtract two vectors. We've talked about what it means to multiply a vector times a scalar. Well, what if I want to multiply a vector times a vector? What does that mean? Now, I remind you, philosophically, you don't want to th- come at this problem from the point of view of, oh, you know, it's got to mean, there's got to be some canonical d- definition that it sort of has to be. And how do I write down that formula, right? That's not how math works. We get to make whatever definition we want with the understanding that if our definition doesn't make any, doesn't connect in any way to anything interesting, if nobody cares about it, then we're just making stuff up, right? So what we need to do is figure out what would be what operation can we think of that is geometrically natural in some way, perhaps to yet to be determined, um, and that also behaves algebraically kind of like a product, sort of, in some sense. Um, now, uh, uh, when it came to vector addition, I, um, I motivated vector addition sort of in advance, right? We, we looked at the... The, the the physical interpretations of vectors and we from that said well we feel like vector addition ought to be that which is accomplishes the following thing physically so the motivation preceded the definition and that's kind of beautiful when you can do that sadly that's not the case here right so what i'm going to have to do is i'm going to have to write down a definition i'm going to pretty much pull it out of thin air and until I can provide you with a persuasive um, connection to geometry. You should be uncomfortable with the definition I'm about to show you. Because after all, if I don't give you some connection to geometry, I'm kind of just making up a bunch of garbage. right? So don't let me make up garbage. (laughs) I'm not going to do it, but still. Don't trust me too much. Um, so uh, here's the definition. If you, I'm going to define this in R3. If you have uh, a vector v and a vector w in R3, then that little formula right there is the definition of this thing called the dot product. Um, yeah, dot product. Okay. All right, now one thing you'll notice about this, uh, it seems kind of arbitrary. You might be thinking to yourself, that doesn't look cosmetically like it sort of, of course, ought to look, right? I mean, when we wrote down vector addition, there was this sort of algebra, you know, looking at the algebra, you know, how the symbols look on the page, it it seemed to be natural. This looks weird. Why am I adding? Right, I I, kind of get that I'm multiplying coordinate. Multiplying looks like a product. That's a good sign, right? But why am I then adding these terms. That seems very arbitrary. Um, so you should have a raised eyebrow. Don't just don't just trust me that this is a natural thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to persuade you that it's a natural thing, but it's not obvious that it is. Okay. All right. So now let me try to persuade you that this is natural. Um, <clears throat> here's some algebraic properties that it holds. How impressed should you be <laughs> of these algebraic properties? But you could take the point of view that, well, hey, this is uh, this thing is kind of it's recovering. You know, the, this is kind of how algebra was supposed to work. And, you know, sort of at least very familiar looking. You know, back in uh, uh, high school, and that's kind of nice and everything. But uh, let me let me point out that uh, you sh- you should not find this very impressive. The fact that this formula satisfies these properties is not impressive. And here's uh, an example of why. If I were to change my definition to this, right, then all of those properties still work. (laughs) And this formula right here is not geometrically natural at all. 
I mean, in any meaningful, in any useful way. It's not geometrically meaningful. So the fact that these algebraic properties hold, I look, that's nice, and that we're going to make use of that. In fact, it's very nice, and we're going to make use of it. But that does not, that should not persuade you that this is geometrically natural. Yeah? Okay, okay here's the next uh, thing. Uh, this formula that I, again, pulled out of thin air, it satisfies this property. Now, this is getting a little bit geometric. Uh, let me zoom in so I can focus on this. This is getting a little bit geometric because notice what we have here is here's our dot product. Right? So dot product of a vector with itself. And notice the other side of the equation is geometry. We've got magnitude there. That's a length. That's a, this is a geometrically natural thing. So this is our first connection to geometry. Um, how impressed should you be? Um, oh, there's a kind of a peculiarity about this formula. Notice this is not any vector dot any other vector. This is uh, this is just a vector dot itself. I'm not going to be just going around dotting vectors with themselves. I need to talk about what does it mean to multiply vectors times other vectors. And this doesn't even address that. So I would call this a peculiarity. Uh, by the way, it is going to come up a lot. It is going to be very useful. But should this make you think, okay, I get it now. I see why the dot product is geometrically natural. Not really, no. This is a, this is a limited persuasion, I think. How are we doing? Is everybody on board so far? Okay. All right. Um, the next one called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, and let's see. I'm going to get back into here. Here we go. So this inequality right there, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Uh, notice any dot product, any vector, any other vector on the left side, right? So this is uh, kind of algebraically broad, right, as it should be, addressing our complaint from the previous thing we were looking at. Um, and you see the connection to geometry. Look at this. We've got a, a magnitude and another magnitude. So this is a connection between a broad interpretation of dot products and geometry. And that's nice. Uh, turns out um, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is more useful in linear algebra, like in Math 216, than it is in Math 212. We're not actually going to do much with the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, We'll see why in a moment. But uh, one of the complaints that I'll make about the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is that it is an inequality. <laughs> um, and so it's uh, it's not telling you really what the dot product is equal to. If, if I want to persuade you that the dot product is interesting, then I need to come with a connection between the geometry and, and actually the dot product and not uh, just have some sort of comparison. So this is... Not that persuasive either. Really. Okay. Lastly, where it all comes together, this is extremely persuasive, I think. Uh, let's look, uh, look through what we've got. First of all, we've got a broad application of dot product. Any two vectors. Right? Um, equals. None of this, uh, none of this wishy-washy inequality nonsense. Right? Exactly equals, and then notice over here on the right hand side of the equation, we have a magnitude, which is intrinsically geometric, another magnitude, intrinsically geometric, and then angle, which is re again a very naturally geometric thing. That's everything on the right side of the equation here is geometrically natural, and it is exactly what the dot product is. That's pretty persuasive. That okay, somehow or another, this dot product is uh, that's uh, this is meaningful and and significant and not just made up garbage. Does that make sense? Everybody on board? Okay. All right. It's also kind of implausible seeming. <laughs> Let me remind you, uh, you know, our formula for the dot product here. Uh, this dot product is. You know, uh, V1, W1 plus V2, W2 plus uh, V3, W3, right? Doesn't it seem weird that something computed with three-function arithmetic, 
allows you to uh, compute instead something that involves square roots and trig. That's weird. That's really weird. This is sufficiently weird that I, when I very first time I saw this formula, I'm like, "Got to be kidding me!" This, this uh, trivial calculation here connects to this very complicated looking calculation here. That's uh, <coughs> sufficiently interesting to be disconcerting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to prove this formula for you. It turns out it's not that hard to prove. Um, and uh, here's the idea. We're going to look at this picture. So we've got our, our first vector V, our second vector W. Remember, you can talk about uh, uh, the difference of two vectors. There it is, V minus W, head of one to head of the other when they're both in standard position, as these are. And notice that makes for us a little triangle. And triangles are things that you all studied back in trig class, geometry class. Right? And you may remember various among the various formulas that you learned about triangles, uh, one called the law of cosines. And when I say you may remember, I also mean you may not remember. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there it is, law of cosines. Y'all, surely everyone remembers that there was something called the law of cosines. Okay, so anyway, this is what it is. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you want a, uh, a memory tool for the law of cosines, uh, the law of cosines is kind of what you might call a modification of the Pythagorean theorem. So this angle here, um, that angle there, if that were a right angle, uh, then we would have a Pythagorean situation, and that squared is uh, that squared plus that squared. So you can see the Pythagorean equations showing up as, you know, kind of... That's true, very familiar to the Pythagorean equation. All this extra term is over here. This is just a correction term that says if that's not a right angle, then this is how you fix the Pythagorean equation. So that's the way I remember it anyway. Um, okay. All righty. Um, okay, so next thing we're going to do, and by the way, this is a common trick in math common uh, little algebraic move is to take something that you're not intrinsically interested in, compute it in two different ways, and then find how you can benefit from connecting the two results. So, I, I mean, I don't really care about these things as it's going to turn out, but it's going to end up being really interesting to us that these things are equal. So again, very common method in math. Uh, that said, uh, here we go. Um, we've got uh, uh, magnitude squared. Don't forget, magnitude squared is the dot product of a vector with itself. And we wrote that down a little while ago. Um, and then you can foil out that dot product. Um, this you can just rewrite like that. Y'all remember foil, right? Do they still call it foil? Okay, yeah. Cool. They, that did not exist. That little acronym did not exist when I was in school. And so someday when I'm teaching this class, I'll say, do they still call it foil? And they're going to be like, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay, and then don't forget, after having foiled it out, dot product with itself, magnitude squared dot product with itself, magnitude squared. So altogether then, keep in mind, this thing that I've computed two different ways, right? all these things on the right are equal to each other, and this I've now equated to that. And wait a second here, we can cancel the magnitude of V squared, and we can cancel the um, magnitude of W squared, and I can then cancel this common factor of uh, negative 2, and all that's left is exactly what I wanted. V dot W is that. Everybody see how that comes together? Questions? Good happy. Okay. okay. All right. <coughs> 
Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, notice you can solve for theta in that angle. So one nice thing about this formula is that it gives a, a, a remarkably convenient way of computing the angle between two vectors. And you might be thinking, who cares? Because in R2, there was never a problem. And in R2, you have some vector. Well, arctan tells you what this angle is. And if you have a different vector, arctan tells you what that angle is, and you subtract those two angles, and that gives you this angle. It's just nothing to it, right? But the problem is in three dimensions, it's not going to be just angles all measured in the same plane, and that angle and this angle, and you subtract the angles, and everything's sort of lined up, right? What we're going to have is some vector that's pointing up at some angle like that, and some other vector that's maybe pointing down at some angle like that. We're not measuring this angle here, right? And we're not measuring that angle there. We're measuring that tilted angle. So geometrically, the angle between two vectors in R3 looks like a really hard problem. And what we have here, again, is a super convenient way to compute it. Dot product, our three-function arithmetic. That's easy. Magnitudes. Okay, there's square roots involved, but fine, whatever. I mean, I, we can do that. And then all you got to do is take an arc cosine. So that's a really strong formula right, right there. Okay. All right, quick example. Here's a couple of vectors. Um, find the angle between them. And notice, we're just using that formula. Um, the dot product is easily computed as uh, four. The magnitudes are easily computed as three and seven, as it turns out. And uh, so, there you go. Everybody happy? Okay. All right. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, yeah, I didn't write this down. Okay, so let's go back up to our formula. There we go. Nice thing to notice about this formula. Uh, let's think about what happens if, if that is uh, pi over 2. Right? What, what happens if that's pi over 2? Well, this angle is pi over 2. We're taking cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. And that means that the dot product is 0. Um, all right, now here's another. Let's sort of flip it around. What would happen if the dot product is 0? It's tempting to say, well, hey, if the dot product is 0, that means that cosine theta has got to be equal to 0, which means theta has got to be pi over 2. Right? And I've, I've just committed a little math crime. I'll come back and confess and fix it in a second. But um, this is one of the neat properties of this equation. It motivates pretty strongly that the angle between two vectors is a right angle where the dot product is zero. That's uh, an important property of the dot product. Uh, now, let me let me confess my little crime. Um, if this is zero, technically that doesn't mean that this is zero. It is also possible that that could be zero. Right? And it's also possible that that could be zero. And then let's think geometrically. Well, if one of the vectors has magnitude equal to zero, I mean, how do you draw a vector whose magnitude is zero? Um, it's, uh, well, <laughs> it's just kind of, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't have enough length for me to use that length as a way of figuring out what direction it's pointing. It's not really pointing in a direction. Right? So not only could it be that one of these other factors is zero, but in fact, what angle? Well, there is no theta at that point. Right. So the whole thing becomes kind of crashes and burns. Um, so we do have to, you know, sort of, uh, we've got to keep that in mind when we write this uh, result. And that is if you have two non-zero vectors, if you know the vectors are non-zero, then you get the result that we were thinking about perpendicular if and only if the dot product is zero. That's nice. How are we doing? Everybody on board? Okay. Um, <clears throat> here is something kind of awkward about the way we have to say this. Uh, so, 
if the dot product is zero, then that implies, well, I, there's several possibilities if the dot product is zero. It could be that the vectors are non-zero and perpendicular. It also could be that one of the vectors is zero, or it could be that the other vector is zero, or it could be that they're both zero. Doesn't roll off the tongue very, very eloquently, you know? Um, so uh, in order to avoid these kinds of problems, uh, we have a, uh, a related idea. It's very closely related to the idea of perpendicular. It's not the same. Um, the word is orthogonal. Two vectors are orthogonal if one of those possibilities happens. In other words, said differently, two vectors are orthogonal if and only if the dot product is zero. So orthogonal is a nice word. Uh, it encapsulates a bunch of possibilities, all of which correspond to the dot product is zero. Now, a complaint, a reasonable complaint, is uh, you might say that, uh, well, yeah, but then orthogonality is, uh, this is, we're just, uh, we're sweeping the dirt underneath the rug. It's the, 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 in the awkwardness is still there. Orthogonality still means several possibilities, one of which is much more interesting than the others, and this is just, uh, this is a way of hiding confusion. A complaint could be made. Um, and, uh, I, and I get that, right? But it turns out that's not the case either. It turns out sometimes orthogonality the dot product being zero, sometimes that's actually more interesting than perpendicularity. It's hard to see this coming. <coughs> Turns out to be the case. So anyway, um, this is going to be a very useful construction, this, this, uh, this word orthogonal. Okay. Um, all righty. A um, couple of quick applications of dot products. Um, suppose you want to, uh, here's the geometry uh, of the picture we're going to consider. Suppose you have some vector v and you've got some vector w and you're interested in the following question. I want to look at the direction defined by w. Right, This vector w here defines uh, that direction. And I'm interested in this vector v, sure, but but uh, I'm really, I'm more so interested not just in V, but in the extent to which V points in this direction. Right, so here's a silly example of in football, right? If this is where the ball was, and there's a, you know, a pass, and the guy receives the ball here, and then he gets tackled, right? So the ball was here, then he, uh, then now the ball is here. How many yards did the uh, progress got made? Well, you, you don't look at the length of the vector how far he ran, or how far the, the ball flew, that's not the point. What matters is, how far did the ball move in forward, in the, in the forward direction, right? So the extent to which he ran sideways, you don't get credit for that, right? That makes the game too simple. So um, what you're interested in there is uh, what we call a component. And there's many more reasons than football, of course, to be interested in this uh, construction. So this thing here, that distance is called the component of V in the direction of W. And it turns out it's not hard to compute. Uh, it's no big deal. Um, I went the wrong way. Uh, Now, okay, let me highlight like this. We're going to look at this triangle. Right? And think back to trig class from uh, high school. And think about you know, this component that we're interested in computing, this distance. Well, that's one of the edges of this triangle, and there's a hypotenuse, and there's an angle. This is a right angle. And trig then tells us uh, this equation right here. Right, so the component is the length of the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to take that formula, length of the hypotenuse times, so magnitude v cosine theta. And I'm going to rewrite that here. Now I claim that that's morally the same equation. Uh, I did, I will confess, 
multiply and divide by the magnitude of W, but that's perfectly legal. Who cares? Right? So you still have component that is magnitude of V times cosine theta. Um, the reason I did this, the reason I stuck in this, you know, let's multiply and divide by magnitude of W is because now my numerator is exactly a dot product, and so I can rewrite component as be computed by a handy dandy little formula involving dot products. And the reason you care about this is that dot products are easy to compute. Three function arithmetic, so easy. All right. Okay, um, this uh, brings me to an awkward thing to talk about. Um, something I haven't done for y'all yet about the dot product is tell you what it really is. You know, you know, what does it look like? Where point to the dot product, right? So with vector addition, we had that. With vector addition, um, you, know, you got a vector there and a vector there. Uh, the sum of two vectors. It's this thing here, right? There it is. There's what it. There's the sum of two vectors. Where's the dot product? <laughs> what does the dot product look like? And I have not given you an answer to that yet. Um, the the closest thing I've given you is well, here's a connection. I mean, there's the dot product algebraically, and here's a formula that involves things that I can point to, but. Why? I mean, what, what does it look like when you combine these geometric objects and where's the, why does that, you know, what does it look like? We don't really have an answer to that question. Uh, and there's not really a good answer to that question. Um, this is another thing that happens sometimes in math. Sometimes we can find things that connect to other things in weird ways and the nature of that connection is not immediate and yet it's still useful because we at least have a foot in the door that relates these ideas to those ideas and then algebra lets you work with whatever to get what you need out of there. So this is one of those situations. I can't exactly point to what the dot product is, but this is the, about the closest that I'm going to be able to get, and that is uh, to notice that when one of the vectors is a unit vector... I'm going to say W in this case. If W is a unit vector, look at this formula here. If W is a unit vector, that means that this magnitude down here is 1. And what I recover then is that in that case, the dot product is a component. And that's something I can point to. Right there it is. A component. So that's somewhat satisfying. Again, if you had this urge to this need for, I need to be able to point. If I'm going to write down an operation, uh, if I'm going to define a new algebraic construction, I need to be able to point <laughs> geometrically to what that thing is. This is the best I can give you. But I cannot emphasize enough, this is only actually true if W is a unit vector. If W is not a unit vector, doesn't work. So, yeah. anyway, it's an interesting uh, thought. Okay, um, do y'all? Uh, how many of y'all have taken a physics class in intro physics mechanics? Many, but not all. Okay, all right. So, for those of you who have not had an intro physics class, there's this thing called work. Uh, work is a measure of how much energy it takes to accomplish a certain task. The units of work are energy. And I don't want to get into the whole, you know, physics units thing, but it's a measure of how much uh, effort it takes, you might say, to, to accomplish a task. Um, and the formula that they give in intro physics classes is this right here, work is equal to force times distance. Uh, this is an oversimplification. There's a big asterisk on this formula, and that is that uh, this computes work if the force that you are applying is force that's applied in the direction of the distance that you're pushing your thing. Right? So, easy sort of stupid example is, you know, if I want to, let's take this pen, it's got a, I'm applying a certain force to keep it from falling to the ground. Um, how much work does it take to move this one foot? Well, I take the force that I'm applying and I multiply by one foot, and that's valid if you're raising it a foot. But if you're going over this way, that's not how it works. 
if I were, if I wanted to get this pen from here to here, the clever move would not be to hold it. Right, that's hard. My muscles are getting tired. Uh, what the clever move would be to get a cart, right? Set it on the cart and uh, make sure the wheels are all nice and greased, right? And then just kind of give it a gentle push and just watch it effortlessly. No work at all, right? And it would just go right on over. Okay, no work because the displacement was that way, but the force was that way. Yeah? Okay, so this formula here then is highly flawed. This formula... Uh, in the formula itself, it doesn't recognize this thing about, look, you've got to make sure that the force and the displacement are in the same direction. Okay. All right, so uh, I'd like to show you how to fix that. It turns out dot product are a great tool. Uh, for this, first observation I'll make, one of our very initial, the very first example we ever gave of vectors was that displacement was a vector. That's another flaw of this formula. It's treating displacement, which is a vector, it's treating it as a scalar. That's not right. Um, likewise, forces. Right? Forces, this is treating forces as scalars, but that's not what a force is. A force is a vector. A force has a direction. So this is a weird formula, really. Uh, to get right down to it, force and displacement should both be vectors. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, here's how you fix the formula. Um, I want um, uh, work is equal to force times distance, but this force should be the component of the, the actual force, the actual force vector in the direction that you're actually going, right? So that component calculation we talked about previously. That's the relevant part of the force. I don't really care about the extent to which the force is moving in a different direction than the displacement. Um, the distance here, distance is, well, it's the magnitude of the displacement vector. So if I, if I want to compute work equals force times distance, there's the formula for the force. Multiply by this formula for the distance, you see that those displacements just cancel, or those uh, magnitude of displacements, those just cancel. And what you're left with is just force dot distance, uh, uh, displacement. So th this is a lovely fact, and by the way, something that uh, not only is it extremely uh, important in physics and mechanics, uh, that you can compute work with a simple dot product, um, but also something that we're going to do a lot of in uh, the last chapter of this book. Um, the, uh, remember I was saying how the, the course kind of is on this up, it gets harder and harder. So when we get to the, the very last part of the, of the course where things get real interesting, um, this is going to be one of our main formulas. So very natural because, in fact, displacement is a vector. Why not recognize it as a vector? Force is a vector. Why not recognize it as a vector? And then the work formula becomes just a dot product. Okay, moving along. Um, okay, so cross product and determinant. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, why don't we go for another, let's go for another 10 minutes. Let's, so at 11 o'clock or so, um, we'll, we'll take a break, uh, about a 10 minute break, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll pick up. So, um, um, yeah, so I want to talk about cross product and determinant. Um, cross product is really our primary goal here to talk about. Uh, whoops. Uh, it turns out that there's some very strong relationships between cross products and determinants. Some of y'all might have seen determinants here or there before. Um, but we're going to probably show you some things that you haven't seen before with determinants. Um, and both of these connect to this idea that I, like, that I call right-hand order. Um, and uh, so because that's the, probably the least, well, I don't know, it's, this is um, the most geometrically sort of new concept I'm going to start by talking about order, and I'm going to actually start by talking about a, 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 a simple version of this, sort of the two-dimensional version of um, uh, in R2. So let's let's consider two vectors in R2, 
v and w. And uh, let's suppose I write down v comma w. And when I say I write down v comma w, what I mean by this is I'm, I'm making a list of these two vectors, and specifically that I'm writing v first. Let's just say. Uh, as opposed to writing down w comma v. So in comparing these two different orders, these two different you know uh, lists that I can make, you know v comma w versus w comma v, how would I distinguish between these two orders? And and, and let me give you a smart alecky answer first. Uh, this one is alphabetical order, and this is reverse alphabetical order, right? Okay, now clearly I'm being silly. Why is that silly? It's silly because it come on, and we're, that, now we're just talking about the labels that are on the vectors. So let me make the question a little bit more precise now. What is geometrically, what is a way of geometrically distinguishing between these two orders? So there's there's different ways that you can talk that you can do this, um, and I'm just going to cut straight to the one that's most interesting for what we're doing, and that is um, uh, go to the, the following page here. Let's look at the first vector, whichever one is listed first. Right? There's that vector. Look at the line defined by that first vector. And then uh, notice that that first vector, there's two different ways that you can kind of rotate, if you will, from, that you can move clock, that would be the clockwise direction from the first vector, right? And then this would be the counterclockwise direction from that first vector. Uh, noticing that the second vector is on the counterclockwise side, I'm gonna declare V comma W so V listed first, W listed second. I'm going to call that a counterclockwise order because from the first vector, you would rotate counterclockwise to get to the second vector most sort of quickly, if you will. Everybody see what I'm talking about? And notice that this does distinguish between the two orders. So as I have it drawn here, V comma W is counterclockwise. But if I were to switch it, and if I were to list W first... Which way would you rotate? You would have to rotate to get to the second vector, V. You would have to rotate clockwise. So V comma W was counterclockwise, W comma V clockwise. Everybody on board? Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is in at least some way, it certainly is geometric of a sort, right? Why this is useful yet to be determined, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, it's geometric, you gotta give me that. Okay. All right, um, so a um, couple observations I'll make about um, this, uh, this convention that we've made. Uh, first, if you have a counterclockwise order, then if you switch the two vectors, If you switch the two vectors like so, then the result is a clockwise order. So switching changes the order, and that's always true. Uh, if you have two vectors that are in clockwise order, switching them makes counterclockwise, etc. Okay. The other thing is I'll point out, that I'll point out is that these are reflections of each other. And now let me come down here and draw a picture. Uh, if you have a couple of vectors uh, v. W. Oh, uh, well, sorry. Here, I got ahead of myself. If that's V and if that's W, and if I write down, uh, you know, V comma W is uh, let's see here. V comma W is counterclockwise, right? Then if I were to reflect these vectors. All right, so there's uh, W prime, V prime. Well, V prime, W prime, just reflecting those two vectors, V and W, the result is now you'll notice clockwise. And this always works. Um, any pair of vectors 
in a list, when you reflect the vectors, you change the order. Pretty plausible, right? We, we, we've all uh, looked in the mirror at a clock and noticed it's going backwards. Right? Okay. All right. All right, now here's where things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, I'm going to call this problem that we've just considered a relatively easy problem, two vectors in a plane. We've all seen clocks, clockwise, counterclockwise. It's an old, familiar notion. Here's where it gets really hard. What would be the three-dimensional version of this? So instead of two vectors in the plane, what if I had three vectors pointing in wildly different directions in space? Uh, and if I wanted to write down, like, um, you know, uh, A comma B comma C, what is there some geometric, is there something that's geometrically interesting about the way that I've written it? Is, is this A, B, C, is that, um, what geometric description could I give of that order? What is geometrically natural about how I've written this down? Kind of analogous to the whole clockwise, counterclockwise thing. And I, this is a hard problem off the cuff, right? So let me just show you the answer. Uh, the answer, um, I'm just going to skip down to my drawings of it. Um, if you have a listing uh, A, B, C, um, note in particular then A is the first vector listed, B is the second vector listed, C is the third vector listed, right? So we're not talking about just the, the trio. We're not just talking about this as a set. We're talking about this as an ordered list. So what is it about that ordered list? What, what How would I geometrically describe it? Um, first, take the first two vectors. Those first two vectors describe a plane. Right? So those you got two vectors like that, and uh, there's going to be a unique plane that is parallel to both of those, you know, A and B, and that also goes through the origin. Okay, next, observe that. <laughs> by the way, this right here was the hardest picture that I drew in the book. This took me, I don't know, hour, <laughs> hour and a half. That's hard. Human hands. Anyway. It's easy to draw a hand badly. That's easy, right? But to make it look kind of halfway decent is hard. Um, so yeah, so do this. Um, put your index finger in the direction of the first vector, and this is one. This is the rule: index finger. By the way, right hand. Only well, apologies to the left-handed in the crowd, but index finger. You got to keep your index finger parallel to the palm. Don't do anything weird like this, right? Index finger parallel to the palm in the direction of the first vector, and then middle finger in the direction of the second vector. Now, again, there's some rules. No hand yoga. Don't bring your middle finger back there at a weird angle, right? Um, only bend your middle finger in the way middle fingers want to bend. It's just you know, normal bending, right? Index finger still parallel to the palm. Right? Notice you can, you've got the flexibility, you can keep that index finger pointing in the same way that it's pointing while still it's kind of rotating. So rotate your hand around however you need to, but do it in such a way that you can then get your middle finger to go in the direction of that second vector. Right? So you're just kind of, you're using, roughly speaking, this gesture, and you just want to superimpose that on top of those first two vectors. First vector listed, index finger. Second vector listed, middle finger. Very strict rules. Notice that your thumb points again in the, you know, no hand yoga. Okay? Your thumb points on a well-defined side of this plane. Uh, in this case, your thumb wants to point on, you know, what you might call the up side of that plane. Okay, Your thumb defines the, the side of the plane that we want to talk about. So you then decide, you can decide if this, if the list is right hand order by whether or not, you know, does C point on the thumb side of the plane as it, as it is here? Right? If it does, if C points on the, on that, the same side of the blue plane that, that your thumb does, then we say that this listing 
A first, B second, C third. That listing is what we call a right hand order. If it does not, if C points on the other side of the plane, then that trio is not in right hand order. And now I'm going to give you a, um, a gesture argument that usually when C is pointing on the other side, when, you, when, when your list is not a right hand order, it's usually left hand order. Index finger parallel to the palm in the direction of the first vector. Hey, wait a minute, my middle finger won't point in the direction of B. Oh, yes, it will. Right? Again, you can, you can, you can rotate around your index finger. And, you know, keep, your index finger is not changing the direction it's pointing. Rotate as necessary so you can put your middle finger in the direction of that second vector. Notice now my thumb is pointing on the other side of that blue plane. Right? So, thumbs of your hands point in the opposite directions. Everybody see what I'm doing here? It's a hard gesture to do, but notice my index fingers are parallel, my middle fingers are parallel, my thumbs are pointing opposite. Okay. So, most of the time, a few exceptions here and there, um, if your list is not right-hand order, then it's left-hand order. And it turns out that this little construction that we just came up with, um, it, it, uh, it's highly analogous to the whole clockwise, counterclockwise thing. Um, note right hands and left hands are mirror images of each other. So if you reflect vectors that are in a right hand order, you get a new list of vectors in a left hand order. Right? And, um, this one's a hard one to do, but if you have a list that's in a right hand order, if you switch two of the vectors like that, now again, this is I, this is no longer a right hand order. You know, the, the, the rules of right hand order are index finger parallel to the palm. But but anyway, first vector, second vector, third vector. If you change the orders where this is now first and that second, it's a left hand order. So this is exactly the properties of clockwise counterclockwise. Clockwise, counterclockwise, if you switch two of the vectors, it changes the order. Ditto for right hand, left hand. Um, if you mirror, that changes the order. Just like clockwise, counterclockwise. Anyway. Okay, so that's what uh, that order is. Uh, that makes for a good stopping point. Uh, we will come back in about 10 minutes or so. So let's take a, take a little break and um, we'll uh, keep going.